Some of you may have tried to come to this event one time before, two times before. Anybody try all three times? Oh, a whole bunch of you. Um, and, and clearly, uh, John Mogulescu has done something to uh, make the uh, weather gods unhappy. But uh, at least it's not snowing, and, um, and we're going to have a fantastic Fantastic night. Good evening, everyone. I'm Ann Kirshner. I have the privilege of serving as the president of Hunter College. Um, and welcome to this edition of Mapping the Future of Higher Ed, when neither illness nor the weather will stop us. Um, it's wonderful to be here at the Roosevelt House Public Policy Institute at Hunter College, the former home of Franklin Delano and Eleanor Roosevelt, most famously known as the place where FDR after being elected, brought together the team that built the New Deal right upstairs, the room where it happened. And now it is, fittingly, Hunter's home for policy, history, and human rights. Deep thanks to Harold Holzer, the Jonathan F. Fanton director and his staff for making his home so special for us and for so many parts of Hunter College and CUNY. There are so many CUNY <laughs> friends in the house. Um, John, it's really, it's really wonderful. Um, special thanks to my friend Tony Meyer and the Meyer Family Foundation for their support of this series. And also special thanks to our co-host Cass Conrad, the executive director of the Carol and Milton Petrie Foundation which generously supports programs at Hunter and across CUNY promoting student success. Um, and uh, before that, Cass was one of uh, John's most talented teammates, and I know there are others in the house tonight, Suri Deitch, I see you, I see you over there, um, and so many others. So the future of education is a vital issue uh, of policy, of history, and of course of human rights, and it is of major, direct, and deep significance to everyone in this room. Hey, I see you too. <laughs> Sorry, there's a lot of friends in this room. It's my pleasure to introduce you now to John Mogulescu and Dara Byrne. John is here in his uh, latest capacity as author, um, the author of Dean of New Things, Bringing Change to CUNY and New York City, but we know him as our longstanding colleague at CUNY, where he was senior university dean for academic affairs and also the founding dean of CUNY's School of Professional Studies and the principal mover behind a really amazing list of trailblazing initiatives such as ASAP, the Gutman Community College, early college high schools, Cass, I know you were part of that, um, the P-TECH High School, so many of CUNY's greatest hits. Innovations that have gone on to become national models in higher education, and it was John and his team who were the inventors, and even more important than being just the inventors, they were the executors. You'll be hearing all about that and more tonight as we hear from John in conversation with another CUNY colleague and innovator, Dr. Dara Byrne. Dara is the Dean of Macaulay Honors College. She was previously Dean of Undergraduate Studies at John Jay College, and all in all, she has spent two decades, you're too young to have spent two decades doing anything, <laughs> as a professor, researcher, higher education leader, uh, an expert in developing student success programs. Most recently, she's been thinking and developing approaches to how artificial intelligence can also help transform higher education. Let me just say one more thing on a personal note. Um, I came back to Hunter this year because this mission of public education, CUNY's commitment to access and excellence and innovation and affordability on our gigantic scale is to me the greatest work in town. It is not easy to do this at CUNY, this giant bureaucracy. Um, and in fact, it's not easy to do it anywhere in higher education where the forces against change sometimes attack innovation like it's a germ instead of a vitamin. So that's what this series uh, for me has really been all about, to highlight the road ahead. And these two higher education leaders put me in mind of one of my favorite quotes, also from Roosevelt, but Harold, this one's Teddy, not Franklin. Far and away, the best prize that life offers is the chance to work hard at work worth doing. 
So with thanks to all of you for coming out in the rain tonight um, and much admiration uh, and affection for these two who work hard at work worth doing, let me turn you over to Dara and to John. That is a difficult introduction to follow. <laughs> Thank you so much, Anne. Uh, so it is true, uh, I am actually on year 23 in CUNY. Uh, this is all moisturizer, so don't, uh, don't start <laughs> counting. Uh, and one of the things that I found so exciting about this book was to see my entire work history um, unfolding, particularly because I moved from being a junior faculty member into administration at a, the time when a lot of this work, particularly under the leadership of Matthew Goldstein, was unfolding. Now, I wouldn't have understood many of the things that were happening, certainly the seismic changes that were happening in the institution, but it was all translated for me by the president of my college at the time, Jeremy Travis, who is in the audience today. And so I share that with you because reading this book, and if you haven't read this book and you've worked in CUNY, I would really urge you to uh, pick it up and start reading. You will find yourself connecting in inspired ways. And that led me to thinking a lot about uh, ways that we could explore the landscape of the modern universities in this conversation. And I'm going to start with a quote that inspired me as I was reading this wonderful book. If your in actions inspire others to dream more, learn more, do more, and become more, you are a leader. You will see throughout these pages that John embodies that. Though he describes himself as an anxious leader, uh, what you take from it is clearly that he is an inspired and innovative leader. Inspired leaders don't merely delegate task, tasks, but they cultivate an atmosphere that encourages proactive engagement. And we know through the many leaders who came from Camp John, who went on to do incredible things, that he inspired many others in this proactive in, in, environment. So John, the title, The Dean of New Things, suggests a certain authority or expertise in innovation. Could you elaborate for the audience on what you mean by new things, particularly 35 years worth of new things, <laughs> and how they intersect with the modern CUNY we see today? Uh, let me, one, thank Anne and thank Cass and thank Angie Thomas over, over there. It's hard to believe that this is our, finally it's happening after two cancellations. <laughs> so I, I, I greatly appreciate that and thank Dara as well. And then, um, it, it's hard for me kind of not to get a bit emotional to see that clump of people right over there, uh, which is filled with people that I worked with closely who were part of our team. And, and uh, uh, you know, I got a lot of the credit, but they did a lot of the work. And, and I'm grateful to all of them. I, could, I don't want to take too much time in mentioning them all, but, but it's an amazing group of, of, of people. Um, the Dean of New Things was not my title. I mean, I, I adopted it, but when I left CUNY, uh, Rick Firstman, who was in the communication office, did, asked me to do a podcast. And he, he, he began it by saying that, John, imagine that, how John Mogulewski became the Dean of New Things. And when I decided to write the book, I went back to that and said, boy, that is a good title. And, <laughs> and, uh, and I, I spoke to Rick and I, I said, is it okay for me to use that? And, and, and he said, yes. And so when, when it comes to how I define new things, it's, it's by definition. It's something that did not exist before. And, and so if you look at what we did from my early days at a college for 13 years and then moving to the central office and, and being at the central office for 34 years um, and then being the founding dean of the CUNY School of Professional Studies at the same time that I was the university senior university dean for academic affairs, the listing of new things that we did will go, can go on and on. So we built two new colleges, we created ASAP, the most successful community college program in the history of the United States, I would argue. We created CUNY START that kind of changed the way we thought about remediation. We had this incredible research unit 
We worked so closely with the Department of Ed and the schools and didn't permit all the blaming of the public schools for having underprepared students to get in the way of what we were trying to do. Um, and, and so for 35 years from my time in the central office, we never had a year that we didn't do a lot of new things. And then the last thing I would say about it is we rarely took tax levy money to do it. We were really good at bringing in dollars from the outside. And, and whether it was in early childhood uh, education, I see Sherry Cleary here, or workforce or, or, or uh, K-12, um, we became this entity that generated about a quarter of all the dollars generated by all 25 colleges in the university. Our unit at the central office was about a quarter of all of that, uh, of that money. So in terms of innovation, it had to do with, and you know, things that did not exist before. And we can get more into that as we go on down. So on page 187, 188 in the book, there's, you're going to hear me refer to some passages. Confession, I, my undergrad and my master's are in English literature, so I have that kind of uh, reading style. Uh, what he writes there is that for big problems, simply tinkering is not enough. And throughout the book, there's a lot of building. And, but you also list on page 188 a sort of a playbook that you, you kind of abide by. And at the center of that is a focus on collaboration. Could you tell us a little bit about collaboration and particularly collaborating with external stakeholders to the university? Yeah. Um, you know, one, we had the, the uh, we were fortunate to have a big unit. Started with five people. 20 years later in the central office, we were over 300. And so, and they were all, you know, whether it be K-12 or early childhood or workforce or, or research or, 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 and I could, go, I could go on and on and continuing ed. Whenever we had a new idea, we could bring people in from all over the place. And we didn't worry. They were all on grants. And so, and everyone liked to say yes. So, so uh, uh, you know, we, 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 we just, we just kind of uh, did that. Uh, we also, you know, kind of opened up, whether it was building a new college like Gutman or, or uh, ASAP or SPS, opened it up to faculty. And, and whether it was Vida was there or Matthew or, or, or Phalo, um, we always offered the opportunity to faculty to join with us. Unfortunately, all too often, um, faculty leadership uh, um, uh, uh, often was against what we were trying to do. And whether it was the union or the faculty senate, um, uh, nothing was easy. And we had battles over everything. I was talking to Dara earlier, and I get the clarion. Uh, Bonnie may get it and, uh, and at, at home. And this, and this issue of the clarion has a big uh, article on ASAP and the importance of, of uh, saving it and not being it, having uh, uh, be you know kind of um, negative cuts because of what's going on. Well, when we started ASAP. There was huge opposition to that, as there was with SPS, as there was with CUNY Start, and, and over and over again. So my feeling about that is you provide opportunity, and then you work with the willing. And, and you know, you kind of duck under the criticism, and hopefully you have a, a big boss who you know, backs you up and doesn't mind you taking risks. And for 14 years, I had Matthew Goldstein. And, and he enabled us uh, to do what we did despite newspaper articles and clarion articles and, and hostility. Uh, and yet, in everything we did, we worked with faculty who wanted to do new things. And so whether, let's say, SPS, and when we were asked to do the first online program with CUNY, there were faculty all over the university who wanted to have the opportunity to, to, uh, to open online programs, couldn't do it on their campus. There wasn't any interest. It wasn't as good as, it, it, and, and all the reasons you hear. Well, we enlisted them to build, you know, 27 degree programs in, in uh, 12 years, which, which is unheard of at, 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 at CUNY, you know. So, so you know, collaboration when possible. And then the outside people, um, and this is crucially important, um, every one of our unit leaders 
had a responsibility of, of, of generating new ideas and money. Um, and we like to say yes to everything. And city government <coughs> and the foundation world began to understand that we not only had ideas, but we could deliver successfully uh, that idea. And so, you know, we, we were able to get support from some of the major foundations in, in this city. And we had the advantage of doing intra-city agreements with, with city agencies. Uh, we didn't have to go out to bid on those. And, and the city agencies became to trust us, whether it was Bloomberg or de, or de Blasio for a lot of that, that time. And they wanted to work with us, you know, whether it was ASAP or ACS or Homeless Services or HRA. And we worked with virtually every city agency, and they gave us big contracts to, to, to do a lot of the work. We were generating, you know, Gary Dine is here, our fiscal person, close to $100 million in grants every year just to do these kinds of programs. And, um, and, and, and then we had a, a, a unit that was filled with really smart people. Um, and they, you know, and they're here, you know, Cass, Angie, I, 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 I see Eric and, and Jeanette and Danny, uh, you know, and Surrey in the back who's now a president of one of our colleges, and, 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 and Sherry Cleary. I mean, I could go on and on, and, and, and we had fun doing it. I mean, we, we just liked each other, and, you know, we didn't always get a, this, uh, agree, and, you know, and, and we had some tough-willed people as well, you know, that, that they didn't mind telling me you don't know what you're talking about, you know. But, but for the most part, we had idea people, and then we had people who, who knew how to implement and paid attention to detail and returned phone calls the day they got them and emails and now texts, and I was crazed about that, of course, as everyone knows. <laughs> and, and now that world has probably changed, but... But uh, it was important. So I don't know. I went on a little much, Dara, no, there. So. Perfect. It was perfect. So there are some spicy parts in the book. I am not covering those. Um, <laughs> I'm not covering those. I'll leave that to the audience to ask questions. I am trying in these questions to cover for you, especially those who may not have read it yet, um, some of the themes that are happening in the book. For example, um, Later on in, in the book, around page 298, <laughs> John talks about um, what you need for change, particularly the interplay between uh, vision and strategy. And if you're trying to uh, build or disrupt, uh, these two pieces need to work together. It's clear that you see your unit, the unit that you led, um, as the senior university dean's office as the centerpiece of that. Could you talk a little bit about, a little bit more, because um, you have a couple of examples in here where you try to really take on the tension between tradition and innovation in academia. And those of us who do this work, you know, we have some, some scars from taking on some of those types of things, but you don't really focus on that as much as you focus on the, the meaning, the mission, and the opportunity. Can you talk a little bit more about tradition and innovation and disrupting that kind of tension? Um, <coughs> we wanted to disrupt. I, I mean, we, we, I was hammered and came to believe by some of the, the former old-time staff that CUNY was not doing as well as it needed to do. You know, that, that you can't have 11% graduation, three-year graduation rates at our community colleges. You can't say that it's all the fault of the Department of Ed or the students and they're poor and all the reasons that are true without looking in the mirror and saying, what, what do you need to do to, to, to fix it? So, so if it were a tradition and didn't make any sense, we tried to take it on. And, and for a while, we were this unit in adult and continuing ed, the non-credit side of the house. No one cared. No one paid attention. And then we did a program called the CUNY Language Immersion Program that revamped how we did ESL instruction at the university. It wasn't working that well. And it wasn't enough hours. And we, and we, and we, we, we were embracing.
race by then Chancellor Reynolds actually to, to, to figure that, that out. And when Goldstein came in, um, I was the university dean for adult and, and Louise Mira, I should say, as well, who was the executive vice chancellor, and I was the deputy to Louise ultimately, and and we we became dear dear friends and partners. Um, you know, there was we, we, there was a sense that we had to do better, and we had to do better because what we were about was student success, and often the tradition gets in the way of of that because no one wants to talk about it, and so you know when we were beginning. I don't know if it was ASAP or Gutman, and and we went around and we we went around uh, to try and enlist people to understand why we were doing it. I remember one forum at BMCC. You know, it must have been two hundred people there. And Tracy Mead, who's not here, she now lives in Maine, who was the person who led that initiative. And there was there was a hostile series of questions: Why are you doing this? You know, what? Why not just give us money as opposed to doing something new? And I would always ask this one question, and my team here has heard this and probably a hundred times, but, but, and the question was, do you know what your graduation rate is at BMCC? And they, it was like blank faces. It, it was like, you know, why are you asking that question? And, and um, so a few people knew, and I said it was 11%. And, and it was the same at Ostos, and, and this is not to attack what was going on, but to say that that status quo was simply not acceptable. And you know, then you do ASAP, and, and you, you get 53% in the first pilot of, of, uh, of, of uh, 1,100 students. Now, we, we, were, we, were, we cheated a little bit, because the first pilot, we didn't put in people who needed, who, who needed remediation. But, but ultimately, when de Blasio comes in and, and, and gives us $77 million for a program that was a Bloomberg program. And, and when you think about that, that program has gone from 1,100 students to 25,000. I think it's one of every three new freshmen that are coming into CUNY. We're still at close to 50% from what it was before. And so I don't know if that's tradition, Dara, or just common sense that you you have to kind of figure out what, what you need to do to, to, to do better. Now, we didn't always succeed. We, we did the same thing with remediation. You know, CUNY Start was the people coming in with the lowest level of, of reading, writing, and math um, never got to the finish line. Zero. You could predict that they weren't going to get to the finish line. So we gave them a full semester of, of stuff where they deferred their admission for a semester and, and uh, were, were given, you know, 25 hours a week of, of, of how you, uh, um, you know, can negotiate college. And, and, and we, were we were criticized for all kinds of things, you know, uh, you know for, for something like ASAP, you criticize how can you make students, our students go full time? Well, when we looked at the data, 89% of community college students started full time. And, and then, then things happened. And so we tried to make that first year more effective and better. So, you know, I could go on and on probably, and we probably don't have that time, but the, 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 I believe in tradition. I think it is important and culture. And in fact, Vita, in, in the book, um, I start the chapter on, on uh, oh no, the reflection chapter, in which Vita asks me, did I just do a series of, of successful programs or did I change the culture? And I said, clearly, we changed the culture a bit by these programs. But in changing you know, all of that, the answer is probably no. And, and yet, and yet you know, just some of the programs alone, you know, thousands and thousands of people who would not have graduated have graduated, gone into the workforce, and, and are, are thriving. And so we're, we're proud of that. So I became, yes, please. So I became the undergrad dean at John Jay in 2016. And I'm proud to share that this is where I cross paths with the work of uh, John Mogulescu, particularly through the ACE program. And I remember uh, some of the concerns from uh, um, offices that wanted to stick to traditions and practices. And I spoke about this with uh, 
President Travis, you probably wouldn't remember this, and Provost Bowers at the time, and their answer was very simple. We will never be able to get these kinds of resources for our students. The program works, and this is what our students deserve. Get it done. <laughs> and get it done, we did. And the graduation rate from that first ACE cohort was double that of the comparison group. So these programs definitely worked, and uh, I'm, I'm really grateful to both of you for that kind of experience of seeing firsthand what new things can really do. I want to read a piece for you um, on page 300 <laughs> that I think summarizes a lot about who John Mogulescu is. Our work was framed by a deep belief that to be great, a public urban university must look beyond providing degree programs. It must use its intellectual resources to assist government and the private sector in solving the most difficult urban problems. We believed that CUNY wasn't as good as it needed to be and that far too many students did not get to the finish line. Through our programs, we extended and, in some measure, redefined CUNY's role and mission. I want you to tell us a little bit about redefining the role and mission. You go on to talk about the relationship between the university and the city, but I'd love to hear it in your own words. Yeah. <coughs> so, I don't believe you can have a great public urban university that doesn't pay attention to what's going on in New York City. You know, no, CUNY, in, in any city that they reside in. I, I just think, you know, it's not just about getting degrees, and CUNY gets a lot of degrees for students. It's about helping the city solve urban problems. And that started, truthfully, uh, in the 80s, in the late 80s, when welfare reform was coming about. And, and we took advantage of, of some opportunity, even within the framework of, of some of the harsher uh, uh, aspects of, of, of welfare reform. And we also took advantage of, of uh, Ronald Reagan's uh, amnesty program, which brought a lot of money in the 80s into helping you know, uh, people get amnesty. Uh, hard to believe today, really, but, but it happened. And, and, and so from that start, and we had all started, a lot of us started in adult literacy and high school equivalency and things like that. And there were you know, hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers who didn't read and write very well. Now, if that's not part of the mission of, a, of an urban university, people would say, well, it's the public schools who need to do that. And the public schools did some of that. Um, and, the, and then the work with the public schools and, and Josh Thomas's and, and, and I see Greg here as, 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 as well, as, you know, um, uh, we, we didn't want to blame the public schools. We wanted to partner with them. And they wanted to partner with us. And so we, we created an agreement in which we worked with them to, to make the transition from high school to college better. And, and um, you know, we didn't solve every problem. Um, but we shared data for the first time. And, and Colin is here, and he, he knows that. And now that is just absolute. You know, in real time, we share data with the with the with with the department with the Department of Ed, and and, and Jeanette is here on that aspect as as, as well. Um, and then you know, after uh, the incidents of Abner Luima and, and Amadou Diallo, the police department came to CUNY to to you know help. We need help with working with with uh, diverse communities, and came to me, and we we. We hired filmmakers, we got money, and we hired filmmakers to, to follow cops around, and then we revised the, the uh, training at the police academy. And, and also, actually, at the end of the Giuliani administration, Howard Safer created a board of visitors to oversee training that was going on in, in, uh, in New York City. I actually became the chair of the board of visitors, knowing very little about it, although I had started in prison education. That was the way I began my, my, my career. And we, we worked with Bloomberg on 311. You know, we had a major unit that, was, that made CUNY students train to work at 311 call centers in the very, uh, very uh, beginning. The question of second language learners, and this is a crazy story. I mean, you know, we, we got money from New York City 
um, to make movies. Uh, they were really half-hour movies, but they were fictional movies. And, and, and uh, to provide an opportunity for second language learners to, to um, learn English, but also learn about city services. And we won two Emmys. And, and it was, it was kind of crazy. And, uh, um, and we, had our, we, we formed a, an ESL production company. Uh, we, we had our own production company in the central office. In the, in the Bronx, we, uh, John Garvey, who was one of our most brilliant uh, people, uh, together with Leslie Oppenheim from many years ago, John came to me, he said, we need to try and demonstrate that we can serve kids who've, been, who've left public school. And we got money from DYCD, and, and we opened a school in the Bronx, which is now called CUNY Prep for a couple hundred kids who had been discarded uh, from the public school system, we wanted to try and demonstrate that we could get them their diplomas and we could get them to succeed in college. We didn't do as well in the succeeding in college as we did in getting them the diplomas. It's part of the book as well, because the person we hired to, to lead that program unfortunately died tragically in the Philadelphia uh, train crash. But Derek, Derek Griffith and the school's named after him. Well, what is, this, what is the central office of CUNY running a school in the Bronx? You know, well, we did. And then we brought in programs to, to bring um, theater and music to kids. Um, again, what is the central office doing that? And I just went to the youth theater performance over the, over the weekend. And, and, and you know, we, we, we have a program that, that that goes into schools using theater as a medium to teach other things. And then we, we, we brought in a music, we didn't bring in a music program. A, a woman I hired to do something wasn't so good at that, but had a, her, 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 her and, 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 but brought a small little program called Harmony, which was based on a program in Venezuela called El Sistema. And, and uh, um, she, I said, you know, it's not working out. And, but I said, I'd love you to st stay and build that program. A couple of my staff didn't think that was such a great idea, actually. But, but, but we did. And, and, and Harmony now you know, provides music education to, to uh, you know, now this year about 3,000 kids, five days a week after school. Five days a week. And they've been embraced by the New York Philharmonic. Anthony McGill, the first clarinetist, is uh, on their board. Joshua Bell is on their board, uh, and it's an incredibly moving, successful program. And again, what? Because this is an issue. Kids don't get exposure to, to theater and music. And, and we were like, well, why not? And, and so we dealt with every single issue of urban intersection with, with uh, um, you know, what I think is the role of public higher education. It doesn't mean we shouldn't pay attention to the degree side. Of course, we should. And, and we, we were focused. And, and Goldstein didn't care that, you know, I, I was a senior university dean for academic affairs. I have an MSW in community organizing. It's not typical, you know. But, and, and, you know, we're filled with, you know, Suri, uh, you know, well, she got her PhD. But, uh, and, 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 and so, I don't know, we just, we just felt that, that you know, this, this was part, it made the job fun, you know, to try and solve these incredibly difficult urban problems. Just made it fun, so anyway. So I'm going to ask one last question before opening it up to the audience. Uh, as I said, I am not covering the spicy parts, but you may want to <laughs> consider doing that. Um, some of my favorite parts of this book touch on the rapidly changing landscape in higher education, including the rise of online learning, the increasing importance of diversity and inclusion, <coughs> as well as the impact of generation gaps between um, staff and leadership. You conclude by um, saying that real change will take more than just talk, and go on to uh, remind us that change is not easy, but that it can be done with bold leadership, new ideas, and a willingness to listen, compromise, and challenge entrenched in interests and obsolete ways of doing things. And so, my final question to you is, are you still optimistic about the university and the university's relationship with the city? Um, 
So that's a hard question, right, for me. I, I mean, yes, I'm optimistic. I, try. <laughs> I You know, CUNY is essential to the success of New York City. It, it has to be able to thrive. I mean, it, it graduates 55,000 students every year. If you, you know, if you look at the, the, the numbers of students, now we're down. We used to be at 270,000 degree students. We're now at, at uh, 226, I think, if that's, if that's uh, something like that. You know, and we used to have 250,000 non-credit enrollments. We're, we're much less than, 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 than that as, 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 as well. Um, <coughs> but CUNY is essential. Now, having said that, CUNY has had a rough, difficult years. We had, we had COVID. Uh, um, we had lots of changes in leadership, which is, you know, not simple. I would say, without trying to badmouth, you know, anything about leadership and board leadership, Matthew Goldstein was was um, lucky. Not lucky. I, I don't know how it happened. To have Benno Schmidt is his board chair. Um, be, because Benno was an educator who politically I was a little suspicious at first. We, we, were, we had different kind of views about certain things. But he came to do two things. One, embrace CUNY as important. And two, to let the chancellor be the chancellor. And, and, um, and, and so uh, that is crucially important and became an advocate for the university. So if a governor or a mayor, you know, would go after, uh, uh, you know, we, we had some battles about budget and things like, like that, it's hard to take on the person who was the president of Yale and Columbia Law School and so forth. And, and, and so he was protected. Now, I'm not so sure that that is the case right now, and I probably, I don't know, this is being filmed, and that's probably <laughs> not a, 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 a great thing to say, but I'm retired, right? So, <laughs> so, uh, um, but, so, um, so, am I optimistic? I'm worried. I mean, public education is not being supported as well as it should be. Uh, it, neither is private, and private, you know, some of those private colleges are going to go out of business, I, I, my sense is, you know, I'm not worried about the elite schools. They will, they, will do, they will do fine. I do say never give your money to Columbia or Harvard or, or, or that. Give it to CUNY. I mean, it, it doesn't make any sense to, to, to me. Um, so I'm kind of, and, and also it has to change. You know, where, where are the students going to come from? Well, the public schools have less students right now. And, you know, and there's a whole sense that higher education is not important, that you can get a certificate, you can get a direct job, and there's a bit of truth to that in some ways, but every bit of data I've seen is that, that a bachelor's degree matters, and, and, and it, it gives you a better life. It gives you a, a, a much better chance of, of earning. So we still have to do better. I'm kind of in the middle about being optimistic or not. I think you have to be willing to have you know, bold leadership who fill, you know, whether it be presidents or system heads, who understand that, that change is important. You know, I, I've watched this documentary on, called Hitsville, The Making of Motown, about five times. And, and, and it's an amazing documentary. It's the Barry Gordy story of how he created Motown. And, you know, of course, you're introduced to Michael Jackson at five and Stevie uh, Wonder at 10 and, and all the things they did. But he had a slogan throughout the, the film, which is, you know, innovate or stagnate. And, and so if you're not innovating, you're not moving forward. And, and, and my view is we were lucky enough, and I pinch myself. You know, I didn't even give you the story of how I got into con continuing. Yeah, I was a social work graduate student in community organizing, wound up with this miracle person, Fanny Eisenstein, and, and a couple of, I see Linda Brown's here, and Bonnie, you know, my wife, who we met there. And, and she, was, she was just extraordinary. She was, she was someone who had vision and, and, and was so inspirational and framed my, much of our thinking about you have to change the world. You have to at least try. And, and you know, I was lucky enough to be surrounded by unbelievably gifted people. And uh, a lot of them are the senior people are right here in this audience. Some are not. And, and so I'm grateful for that. Yeah. I see a question there.
I'm Michael Myers, President of the New York Civil Rights Coalition. My question is related to standards ver and versus um, paternalism. I remember CUNY prior to Al Balka. Right. <laughs> and CUNY means Queens College and City College right. were, were the examples of excellence, academic excellence. Yeah. Post Al Balka, everything seemed to change. They became Sikh. They became they became um, paternalism towards the students. That black students, minority students, weren't as good as white students, and the whole university seemed to change. So my question to you is, what do you do? To, what have you done? What does CUNY do to maintain academic excellence in the in the in the face of paternalism and trying to be and trying to be nice and kind to minorities. Yeah. So, and Michael, I've followed your career as well over many years, and and I I I, in terms of what we've done and what we should have done is that we believe in the I think we believe in the potential of our students, and my my sense of of why I was so agitated of uh, acceptance of low graduation rates because those students were largely black and brown students, you know, and, and who were at our community colleges and, and some of the, you know, uh, uh, four-year colleges that, that, that didn't quite get the same students that Hunter and, 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 and Queens and Brooklyn did. <laughs> Having said that, going back to the days before Balco, I'm a New York kid. I grew up in Brooklyn. I had a lot of friends who went to Brooklyn College. <coughs> we didn't serve a lot of the students who were in this city. They didn't get the opportunity to, to, to go to CUNY. It was a much smaller uh, place. And you know, while you can quibble about some aspects of open admissions and how, how, it's, how it started, it, it's, it's my view that, that um, it was not only necessary, but incredibly important, but that in doing it, I think our team really felt that we were going to measure everything we did. We were going to hold ourselves to high standards. We were going to believe that the students had potential. Um, and we were not going to accept the, the sense that we heard over and over again that it's the student, not that it's just the student's fault, but they're poor, they're on public assistance, they've been in prison, they're single parents. Um, that, that we didn't want to hear that. I mean, there was a lot of truth to that, but that didn't mean that they couldn't succeed in college. And, and so we, we tried to take that on and to some degree were successful. Uh, John, we've been together at CUNY for almost 50 years. Yep. Uh, we've had parallel careers and we tried to do our best and you've done magnificently. My hat is off to you as a human being and as a professional. There is one problem that keeps gnawing at me, yeah. and that is the university management's relationship with the faculty, yeah. which has always been difficult. It's gotten more difficult in, in, in recent times, but the university cannot achieve the heights that we all wanted to achieve without a consolidated, united front between the managers and the faculty, the administrators, and the union. Somehow, we have to find a breakthrough to do that. Spicy parts. I don't know, I don't know. Rich, Richard, I don't know if that's a question or not, but, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 but uh, that's fine. So we'll, we can move on. I, I do have a, some thinking on that, but, but let's move on to other questions, and I, maybe I could circle back to that. So, My name is Peter Goodman. I'm the president of the Education Alumni at CCNY, and I write a weekly blog called Ed and the Apple, uh, 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 the intersection of education and politics. Tomorrow, I'm going to be on a webinar, I think with all the CUNY presidents dealing with how to get the alumni involved in the funding fight. Um, and it, it is so difficult to mobilize alumni. And it seems to me to be something which 
our CUNY as an organization doesn't seem to realize that the hundreds of thousands of, of alumni have the potential of being a tremendous asset for the college. So it's really a struggle to, first of all, to get our alumni involved because they're, by and large, they're not rich people. And by and large, the alumni associations are not rich. We don't really have any money. Uh, so I think looking back in the past is, is fun. It, it, you do wonderful things. But I think looking to the future is always what has to be number one. And I just having my doubts that CUNY Central is aware that building coalitions, to me, the most effective coalition is the fact that there are hundreds of thousands of alumni, many of whom have significant jobs, who are not engaged in CUNY at all. And that's a real concern to me. Now, again, I'm just one guy in the Alumni Association. And again, we struggle to get our members to pay dues. So I would hope that CUNY Central would understand that the alumni can be enormously powerful. And, I, and this time of the year especially, I see Jeff Rodas is here who lives uh, 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 probably half time in Albany. I know that Vince Boudreaux has been in Albany three times the last week. Um, but again, I think there has to be more collaboration among people who have the ability to make changes. Um, you, know, you know, I'm, I, the, the responsibility to alumni is, is from the pre president and the campus level as well as from the central office. And I'm, I'm sure what you say has a lot of truth to it, but, but, you know, we need to do a better job. We just, we just do. And so, you know, I, I, you know, I, I think, again, these are larger conversations and even Richard, your, your conversation. You know, I tried my best, and at the school that I ran, I thought I had pretty good relationships with our faculty. I, I thought that our, our faculty, and I think, you know, some presidents are better than others. And, and, and yet there is this inherent tension between a system office and, and campuses. It, it's just, it's inevitable. And there are th things, you know, I say repeatedly in, in the book, why is it that higher ed so filled with so many smart people are so resistant to change? And, and there's a new book by the former president of McAllister that's out who basically says that he gave up. Now, McAllister is McAllister. It, it will go on. Um, and, and, but I didn't feel that way. I thought we were able to make, make change. So I go back to what I said about you know, working with the willing. But there was often, you know, and I'm not trying to place blame at all, but there was an immediate response from a lot of faculty leadership and, and, and union leadership as soon as it was introduced that we were going to start something new. And you know, the ASAP example in the Clarion is, <laughs> read the article. I, I kind of, I laughed. It was funny. I, I just, you know, it just w weird. Um, so I, I don't know how to solve it except through good leadership. But you know, I don't know. There are a lot of questions that we could. There's read. a question at the back. And please introduce yourself. My name is Mike Porcelli. I teach automotive technology at Bo Bronx Community College. I commend you on everything you've accomplished uh, in your career. But if we're talking about the future of the university, urban university, specifically CUNY, what do you think of the idea that the future lies in the community colleges going back to their roots, teaching trade skills? We are, the university, a major purpose of the university should be to train the workforce for the city, and we're not doing nearly enough. The, anybody can learn all the academic material online. But you cannot learn trade skills online. Do you want your open heart surgery performed by a surgeon who learned it online? <laughs> no, you don't want them rebuilding your transmission if they learned it online either. <laughs> now, I train people who are all low income, and in less time than they could get a bachelor's degree, they can go out and get jobs that make them six figures a year. So we need to focus more on trade education and community college. What do you think of that? And then they can go on later yeah. if they want to to get a bachelor's degree. So you know, I, w I must say I was directly involved with things like that when I was at New York City Tech in 19 started in 1972, and we had three technical programs. One was automotive. It was done out of the Voorhees campus in Manhattan. One was. Uh, that's your program, right? Uh, well, it was. It was. It was. Uh, 
it was at, at City Tech. We had one in electronics. And, and what was the third one that I'm talking about? Machine tools, uh, yeah. And welding, no, welding. Now, the, the question is, which of these are credit worthy and which should be done through continuing education? And, and, and I've been on, uh, you know, I, I spent a lot of work on workforce task forces for a number of mayors and, and, and governors. And we never were able to figure out the whole question of low wage workers. And, and, you know, and so the training that we often did was more related to things like home health aides and home attendance, very quick training that, that led to a job but didn't lead to a middle class life. Those were, are, are still in existence, not enough, and they're expensive as, as well. And it's not that community college, I don't think they walked away. There's, there are a lot of community colleges and city tech as well. And I would argue even the four year colleges have things that, that need to be done. Certainly in healthcare they, they, they do. So I agree with you that there needs to be more, but the idea that all these certificates are going to lead to, you know, good jobs has never been the case in my history, a long history at, in New York City and, 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 and CUNY. They've been around the margins and, and, and what? Now, your program sounds wonderful. So I, I don't know, again, I, I, I can talk a lot. I have a chapter on workforce that I think is pretty interesting in the book. I think I have time for one more question, and I've been mistreating the side of the room. <laughs> Hi. Congratulations, John. I don't know if you remember me. Hi, Ann. I um, am Dawn Barber, and I uh, ran for a brief moment a uh, CUNY Tech Meetup, uh, worked with Central Office, and um, I uh, congratulate you on, on your book, uh, very interesting. But I'm, I'm curious to know how you feel, or if you feel, uh, CUNY students are, um, are well prepared for our current technology landscape, changing technology landscape, moment by moment changing technology landscape, um, and, um, and how important you think that is. Some are and some aren't. I, I, I mean that, that uh, their CUNY gets wonderful students and terrific people, and we get, uh, we get wonderful students, terrific people who are very underprepared. And, and um, you know, and again, the tendency is to blame my colleagues at the Department of Ed for, uh, you know, but, you know, but those issues are re really, really complicated and as to why, you know, and, and I'm not looking for excuses. We all have to have to uh, do do better. So I I don't I don't know how to answer that. I you know I I I uh, I, sh I struggle with 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 that. And you know and so a, a program like CUNY Start or or Clip you know begins to get people to the point where they're ready. Uh, but all the jobs are not in technology either. And, and in fact, unfortunately, and we have some real experts in this room about, about this, when I, when I used to look at the labor statistics in this city, I, it seemed like seven out of 10 of the biggest growth areas were for, for low wage work. And that may be one of the reasons why our community college students are, are decreasing, you know, that, you, that wages have gone up a bit. And, and so you can get a $20 an hour low wage job and, and yet to me you, you still need a degree. So, you know, these issues are all worthy of, I think one of the problems is that we don't talk enough about all this stuff. That, that, we, that, that, that we're afraid to say what we can't do that well and, and also new ideas are not encouraged. I mean, my view is that we never said no to an opportunity. I mean, we didn't, you know, what were we doing making movies? You know, what, 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 what you know, and, and I could go on and on and on. If someone called us from a city agency, we said yes, and then we put a group of people together to figure out what that program would be. And, and you know, what Sherry's did in, in, in uh, early childhood is ex extraordinary. What Cass did in K-12 and Angie in workforce. Uh, um, amazing, but they didn't do it alone. They did it with their teams, and they did it with soft money, and and they they and and so, you know, my and they changed lives. And they, 
and we changed lives. And Didn't they changed you? lives. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. I can't imagine a better, uh, you stuck the landing on that one. Um, so, so tell me, tell me the truth. Do you feel more inspired than when you walked in? Yes, yeah. raise, yeah, yeah, okay. That makes me, that makes me feel really good. Um, so um, I, I can't thank our guests enough. Um, let me just put in a plug. The next uh, one of this series is gonna be on March 27th when we are going to host the presidents of Columbia, Fordham, NYU, the New School, and yes, Hunter College, um, in conversation with Merrill Tisch about the future of higher education in, uh, in New York. Um, in case you missed it, they're all women. Um, I hope to see some of you there, uh, and I hope you will also join us for a reception where John's gonna be signing books. So thank you very, very much for coming, and I'm sure it's not raining anymore, so. <laughs>